More than 3,200 years ago, Egypt was living the final hours of its golden age. Under the reign of Ramesses II, pharaoh of the new empire's 19th dynasty. After a prestigious reign of 67 years, this powerful pharaoh died at the exceptional age of 92 and became for eternity the now legendary Ramesses the Great. His mummy was entombed in the heart of the Valley of the Kings on the west bank of Thebes. Now began Ramesses' great journey towards the afterworld, where he will gain eternal rest on two conditions, that his mummified remains and his tomb be preserved forever. Several European travelers explored the illustrious king's tomb during the 19th century. The principal objective was find out whether the sarcophagus was still there. Now began a fascinating archaeological investigation across time and space that was to reveal Ramesses II's tribulations following his death. Even today, in the burial place of the most famous of all the pharaohs, the adventure continues. This extraordinary story began in Egypt more than 3,200 years ago. In the year 1213 BC, on the 18th day of the first month of the season of the flood, grief overwhelmed the Egyptian people. Ramesses II, honored with the title of the great son of Egypt, had died at the exceptional age of 92. After a prestigious reign lasting 67 years, the pharaoh had joined his father, Ra, the creator of the universe. On the eve of his grandiose burial rites, the whole of Egypt honored the glorious life of this unique sovereign, whose mighty reign was so to influence the subsequent history of his people. For the people of ancient Egypt, it must have been a huge shock when Ramses II died because he'd reigned for over 67 years. And for some people, their entire lives, and some others, two generations of people, this was the only ruler they knew. So it must be like the world was ending. It was here, in the house of purity and in strict intimacy, that the embalming took place. Once the viscera and brain had been removed, the body was dried for 70 days in natron, before being stuffed with plant-based substances and then wrapped in bandages. Inside, the priests secured amulets and little rolls of papyrus considered to have magical powers. This ritual was presided over by Anubis, god of the dead. It was Anubis' duty to preserve the body from putrefaction and to present the defunct before the divine tribunal, sole judge of man's right to survival in the other world. In the kingdom of the just, it was Anubis who reunited the three spiritual elements of the personality required to enter the afterlife, the breath of life, matter, and spiritual light.
When the funeral preparations were completed, the funeral convoy sailed towards the religious capital of the country, the mystic city of Thebes. The pharaohs of the new kingdom had long established the tradition of burial here, in tombs dug deep into the mountain, abandoning the pyramids of their ancestors. It was on the west bank, where the sun dies each evening, that Ramses II was soon to be inhumed, in the shadow of a natural pyramid that casts its shadow on the Valley of the Kings. At dawn on the chosen day, the cortege set off once more towards the final resting place of Ramesses II, near that of his father, Seti I. The magic rites and the fantastic funerary arsenal that accompanied him would enable him to drive off demons and to take wing towards the sky beneath the earth where he would begin a new existence. At the end of this corridor is the funeral chamber where the golden coffin was laid down and surrounded by provisions and personal effects. The pictures and the collection of magic formula painted on the walls were destined to ensure immortality. But the pharaoh could only survive after his death on condition that both the body and the tomb were preserved forever. So it was that 3,200 years ago, in the darkness of the burial tomb, Ramesses II's great journey began. To better understand the Ramesses story following his death, let us return to the west bank of ancient Thebes. The man in the striped pullover is Christian Leblanc. Since 1991, with a team from the French National Research Center, he has been running the archaeological mission that reopened the study of the Ramesseum, or the Castle of a Million Years, and of the tomb itself. Following up every clue and going steadily back in time as they unearth new archaeological layers, they are putting back together, day after day, the immense puzzle of Ramesses II's story. This tomb was still accessible during the Roman period. Visitors entered it then, even leaving their names. In fact, it was only after the Roman period that there was a long silence, a very long silence, mostly due to the fact that the tomb was entirely filled with sediment after torrential rains that flooded the wadi of the Valley of the Kings. Interest in the tomb only reappeared in the 19th century, after Napoleon Bonaparte's military campaign of 1792. The aim of Napoleon's campaign was twofold. Liberate Ottoman Egypt from the domination of the Mamelukes, a militia of liberated slaves, and strengthen the domination of revolutionary France in the Eastern Mediterranean, in opposition to royalist Britain. Although the French army failed in this enterprise, the scientific expedition that accompanied it revealed to the world the splendors of the pharaonic civilization. The publication of Description of Egypt in 1809, a command of Napoleon I, set off an unprecedented wave of Egyptomania in Europe. It attracted diplomats, financiers, adventurers, antique dealers, and representatives of museums pell-mell to the banks of the Nile in search of a bargain. 
This scramble for the riches of the pharaohs also led to an archaeological competitivity between the French and the British that was a reflection of their struggle for influence over the Ottoman viceroy of Egypt, Muhammad Ali. It was in this atmosphere that the tomb of Ramses II was visited in 1817 by the Council of Great Britain, Henry Salt. Salt's clear intention was to find the sarcophagus of Ramses II and its attendant treasure. But a harsh task awaited his workforce, for the corridor was entirely blocked by large deposits of sediment caused by centuries of heavy rain. During his stay in the Valley of the Kings, Salt gradually cleared the tomb to the point at which we find it today. That's to say about 60 meters of the corridor. But he could go no further in this colossal undertaking and had to leave it to his successors to continue clearance of the tomb itself, particularly the Franco-Tuscan expedition led by Champollion and Rossellini, which arrived in 1829. In France, the First Empire had collapsed 15 years previously and the second restoration of the monarchy had taken place, bringing Charles X to the throne. It was he who financed the scientific expedition to Egypt in collaboration with the Grand Duke of Tuscany. This expedition was led by Jean-Francois Champollion, recently recognized for discovering the key to the interpretation of hieroglyphs, and Hippolito Rossellini, a young Italian scholar. Both men visited the monuments of Thebes and of the Valley of the Kings, and both spent some time in the tomb of Ramesses II. They had a double objective, to make a record of the numerous hieroglyphs and to reach the famous golden chamber of the pharaoh. It's important to realize that during the time of Champollion and Rossellini, the tomb had seen the effects of further heavy rain since 1817, so that much of Salt's work had to be done again, and sectors cleared that had once more been covered. Champollion did not make an enormous amount of progress. The sediment was too deep and there was also a problem of time. His journey was not over and he had many other things to see on Egyptian territory. He was unable to completely clear the tomb. It would have to wait until subsequent expeditions, especially that of Lepsius, who would come to Thebes in the Valley of the Kings 15 years later. It was the King of Prussia, Frederick William IV, who sent the Egyptologist Karl Richard Lepsius to the land of the pharaohs in 1843. Lepsius was a Prussian scholar, a linguist, and a pioneer in the new field of photography. He was one of the first to see the importance of saving the pharaonic heritage. Following in the footsteps of Champollion and Rossellini, he began in 1844 to explore the tomb of Ramesses II. Lepsius set up his base in a house at the foot of the mountain of Thebes, and regularly made reports of his progress to the King of Prussia. I began to search the interior of Ramesses II's tomb. It was filled with rubble. Rossellini believed that the tomb had never been completed. I intend to prove the contrary. And if fortune smiles on us, we will find the sarcophagus intact. <laughs> But the difficulties of Carl Richard Lepsius were far from over. The days passed to the sound of picks and shovels, and the workforce became exhausted in the heat and dust. The clearing process was considerable and the terrain uncertain.
مدير في مشكلة هنا كبيرة Lepsius found it impossible to continue clearing the original corridor and ordered his workers to dig a collateral passage where the sediment layer seemed less dense. After several weeks of intense labor, I was at last preparing to go into the passage prepared by my workers. Crawling through the rubble, Lepsius slowly progressed towards the end of the tomb. Would the Prussians succeed where Salt and Champollion had failed? Soon, the archaeologist's tenacity paid off. He finally reached the burial chamber with the secret hope that his reputation would now be made. It's clear that the main objective when Lepsius entered the tomb of Ramses II was to establish whether the sarcophagus was still there. But the golden chamber had been ransacked and the mummy of Ramses II was no longer to be found. Nonetheless, what is important is that the work of Lepsius drew up a precise plan of the tomb. It was the most accurate plan that had ever been drawn up, including not only the corridors and chambers, but also parts of the tomb that no one had ever seen, or that had only been glimpsed by previous explorers. In 1845, by reaching the famous burial chamber of Ramses II, so long sought after by his predecessors, Carl Richard Lepsius put an end to the hopes of the gold seekers. He also left the important legacy of a detailed map. But above all, his discovery had raised a new enigma what had become of the pharaoh's remains. Almost 40 years had passed since Lepsius' discovery. In the spring of 1881, Gaston Maspero left his teaching post at the Collège de France to replace the famous Egyptologist Auguste Mariette as head of France's Egyptian Antiquities Service. Ah, voilà la liste. Eh bien, voilà la liste. Maspero noticed that ancient Egyptian antiquities were appearing on the international market, hitherto unknown to the authorities. He undertook to follow the trail that led from the point of transit, Cairo. Et voilà. He put his assistant Emile Bruch, aided by the Egyptian inspector Kamal, in charge of an investigation into the matter. Little did they know that they would be on the trail of Ramses II. One of the distribution points of the smuggling ring they uncovered was Luxor, the modern name for Thebes. 
With the development of Egyptology, this peaceful little town had become a fashionable resort and its economy had flourished. Part of the souks, business was brisk, and fruit and vegetables were not the only items on offer. Away from the main streets, other buyers and sellers were deep in negotiation. way, Inspector Kamal intercepted several items before they were sent on to Cairo, and from there to the mantelpiece of some rich European collector. Now it was time to arrest the ringleaders and to discover where their priceless treasure was coming from. This is the man they accused. Ahmed Abd Rasoul. The investigation overseen by Gaston Maspero and vigorously carried out by the local authorities quickly led to the arrest of Ahmed. But the complexity of relations between the colonial authorities and the Egyptians caused the investigation to become politicized and numerous witnesses stepped forward in defense of the accused. After several weeks of questioning, the young man was freed while further evidence was sought. In June 1881, Ahmed returned home to his village, Gorna, which lies at the foot of the Theban mountain. استريح دلوقت وبعدين نتكلم 
احمد كله هيتم على خير ان شاء الله ان شاء الله Mohammed, Ahmed's older brother, thought that their worries were over, but the police were hoping that Ahmed would make a false move. أنا عارف أسوي إيه عاد يا مراري كفندية غور غور After a month of discussion and argument, Muhammad, realizing that he could not shoulder such a great responsibility, decided that he would go to the authorities. These are his revelations, as recorded by Gaston Maspero. Ten years earlier, Mohammed and Ahmed were tending their flock. The two young men were making plans for the future when suddenly they noticed one of their goats had strayed. The story goes that the goat wandered so high that to find it, Ahmed had to climb to the summit of the mountain that dominates the Cirque of Deir el-Bahari.
Ahmed Abdel Rasul felt as though he had stumbled on Ali Baba's cavern. Mohammed's confessions led Brush and Kamal to the fabulous hiding place of Deir al Bahari. It is hard to imagine their surprise at the discovery of close to 40 royal mummies lying in their sarcophagi and surrounded by their funeral treasure. It was an extraordinary haul that the Abdel Rasul brothers had ably handled over a period of 10 years, only selling the small pieces. Maspero only visited the site the following year and immediately gave orders for the hiding place to be emptied and its contents to be transported to Cairo. Thus, the royal remains were salvaged from 3,000 years of oblivion and, above all, one of the coffins bore the name of Ramses II. Mesdames et messieurs, a few days later, Maspero was ready to officially reveal to the press the discovery at Deir el Bahari. La découverte exceptionnelle d'une quarantaine de momies datant du Nouvel Empire. 300 ouvriers et 48 heures de labeur énergique et continu. The announcement made the headlines worldwide. Pour terminer l'exhumation. From that moment, the Abdel Rasul family became famous. It is probable that without them, the remains of Ramses II and of the other kings of Egypt would never have been discovered. But this great revelation of 1871 at once raised other questions. When? How and why had the mummies been removed from their original tombs and transported to the Deir al-Bahari hiding place? Furthermore, was the mummy contained in the sarcophagus bearing the name of Ramses II really him? Five years passed. The royal remains and funerary objects had been transferred to the Bulak Museum in the Cairo suburbs for further examination. Not convinced by the inscriptions on the wooden coffin, the Khedive of Egypt, Mohammed Pasha Tufik, wanted to prove the identity of its contents. He gave orders to remove the pharaoh's bandages. The ceremony took place under Maspero's supervision on the 1st of June, 1886, at 9 o'clock in the morning, in the presence of all the dignitaries of the realm. Monsieur, le moment is solennel. great emotion when the illustrious face was revealed for the first time. It only took the experts a few moments to remove the rough cloth winding sheet that had been applied at some date following the original burial and attached with wide strips of red linen. But then, the operation became more delicate. Very little of the original bandage remained, and what was left was like fine muslin.
The pharaoh's name was usually written on a cartouche positioned close to the chest. Spiro was about to reveal it. Now that calm had returned, the unbandaging could continue. Soon the cartouche was revealed. It bore the inscription, Uzar Mahatre, Sete Penre. In other words, Ramses II. The Khedive's doubts were quelled. Votre Altesse, Messieurs. The mummy in the sarcophagus bearing the name of Ramses II was indeed that of the famous pharaoh. Moreover, the inscriptions on the sarcophagus explained why the mummy had been moved to the hiding place far from the original tomb. It all went back far into antiquity. We must go back in time to Thebes two centuries after the funeral of Ramses II. Egypt was in the grip of a serious political, social and economic crisis, marking the death throes of the Golden Age. In Thebes, the situation had become particularly complicated since the clergy of Amman had taken over power. Over the years, pillaging of the royal tombs had become more and more commonplace. And between 979 and 960 BC, the priest king of Thebes, Pinegem I, decided to put an end to the violation of the royal sepulchers and to move whatever remains were left to a secret hiding place. It took three nights to secretly move the mummies and all their funerary objects. So it was about 3,000 years ago that the remains of Ramses II were concealed in the hiding place of Deir el-Bahari. The inscriptions read by Maspero on the new coffin, dating from that event, were, in fact, reports. The first of these reports was written on the lid of the coffin. It explained the transfer of the king's remains from the tomb of his father, Seti I. A second report, also on the lid, detailed the transfer of Seti I's remains to the hiding place at Deir el-Bari, itself an old tomb that had long been pillaged and forgotten, and that had belonged to a certain princess in Hapi. And a third report was found right at the top of the lid, above the head of Ramses II. It explained how the mummy of Ramses had been reinstalled at Deir el-Bari. About 15 years had passed since the identification of Ramses II's mummy. It was now the beginning of the 20th century, and the remains of the pharaoh had become an international attraction. 
They were moved from the Bulak Museum to the newly opened Egyptian Museum, close to the famous pyramids at Giza, where Ramesses II was put on exhibit in 1902. Here it was exposed to the carbon dioxide given off by its many visitors and the damp rising from the floodwaters of the Nile. These conditions were soon to take their toll. In 1907, there took place one of the most surprising episodes in the post-mortem tribulations of Ramses II. It is documented by a traveling French writer, Pierre Loti, who was staying in Cairo at the time. This is the scene witnessed by the attendant of the Room of Royal Mummies. The arm of Ramses II, once so powerful, had been unable to resist the mechanical laws of organic matter. And not only the arm, but the whole body had become infested with parasites. At Pierre Loti's instigation, the mummy was given a mercury steam bath to disinfect it. But this was not enough to save Ramses II from his fate. The deplorable conditions of conservation remained unchanged while the state of the mummy continued to deteriorate. At the beginning of the 20th century, the mummy disappeared. And it was only in 1936 that the new director of antiquities, Canon Etienne Trioton, discovered the upright sarcophagus standing in the apartment he had inherited from his predecessor. In the middle of the 1970s, the Egyptian Antiquities Council once more decided to exhibit the royal mummies. Under the powerful lights, the mummy of Ramses II, still under attack from the parasites, threatened to collapse altogether. Something had to be done at once. At this point, Christiane des roches noble the first woman archaeologist to lead a dig in Egypt, came on the scene. As head curator of the Egyptian Antiquities Department at the Louvre Museum, she undertook to organize in 1976 a Ramses II exhibition at the Grand Palais Museum in Paris. She intended to use this opportunity to do everything possible to save the pharaoh's remains from destruction. As the mummy seemed to be under attack from something yet to be identified, I wanted to get it over to Europe if possible, to where I could take care of it. Mrs. Desroches Noblecourt asked me to approach President Sadat and ask for Egyptian consent for the transfer of the mummy to France. He said, certainly not. But as I was quite convinced that we had to try it, I asked him again. And a few days later, when we went to visit the Suez Canal and stopped off at Port Said, I had the idea that we should treat Ramesses II's mummy as if it was the body of a sovereign. I don't know what Sadat imagined, but he was a sufficiently intelligent man to say to himself, if I allow the body of Ramses to be transported to Europe, it will add prestige to my reign. Because basically, when he accepted, it wasn't simply to show that he respected a mummy or one of his ancestors. He couldn't have cared less. He wanted to make it clear that he respected a great figure of state, a ruler of Egypt, as he was. That was the reason.
On September 26, 1976, Ramses landed at Le Bourget aboard a French army transal and was welcomed with the honor of a head of state. It was an unprecedented protocol. We had to cross Paris with him. So I asked the members of his suite whether they would like to accompany myself and the king in a drive around the Place de la Concorde. Because just in case they didn't know that the obelisk of Ramses II stands in the middle of it, I wanted to offer this last homage to the mummy, and they all agreed. So, a place was prepared for him at the Musée de l'Homme, which wasn't easy, because it's quite a business to get the mummy of a royal pharaoh accepted at the Musée de l'Homme. But I finally succeeded. At the Musée de l'Homme, under the direction of Professor Balou, the mummy was handed over to a hundred researchers and technicians who went to work to prevent its further deterioration and to protect its security. It was a heavy program. There were several stages to their work during the fragile visitor's stay in Paris. To examine the mummy, to diagnose what was wrong, and to elaborate the most appropriate treatment. In the first place, this research enabled the team to learn more about embalming techniques in the New Kingdom and to note their effects on the fabrics. Once the mummy had been emptied of its contents, the first step was to dry it out, because the Egyptian embalmers were quite aware that if the mummy remained damp, it would rot. That was obvious. So they used bicarbonate of soda in small sachets. They left the corpse to dry out for a certain time, also to saponify, and they shrunk the skin onto the bones. Then after a time, we're not sure exactly, let's say about 40 days, they took the natron sashes away, and inside the body they put a series of things. I say things because you find all sorts of things, bits of cloth, resins, unguents, lots of things. In the mummy of Ramses II, there was a great deal of vegetable debris, an enormous amount of chamomile. We also found what looks like nicotinia leaves. There was also a great use of unguents, or at least a mixture of elements, including bitumen, terebinth resin, beeswax, and different fats. Study of the mummy also made it possible to note his physical characteristics. For someone of his time, he was really quite big, because the mummy itself measures 1 meter 72. With shrinkage, we can estimate that he was about 1 meter 75 tall. He is obviously of Mediterranean type and was certainly white, more likely than not suntanned with white hair. So this is an old man with white hair. Another question that has been much debated, how old was Ramses when he died? He came to the throne at 25, and he reigned for 67 years. There's textual evidence for that. So that makes him 92 when he died. Egyptologists tell us that 92 was an exceptional age. At the time, a baby had a 1 in 4 or 1 in 5 chance of reaching 20. Finally, the medical imaging technology available at the time was used to diagnose pathologies present and to identify the cause of death. 
Il avait des pathologies. He had the classic pathologies of an old man. Those that we would expect to find even today. He had arteriosclerosis, that's to say calcium in the arteries. He also had lesions on his shoulders, which would be quite normal at that age. Then we noted osteoarthritis, or perhaps worse, in the spine. It could go as far as ankylosing spondylitis, where the ligaments become ossified, producing a solid spine. Then we noted the dental pathologies. You could say his mouth was a disaster area. But what more could you expect at 90 in ancient Egypt when you consider the state of people's mouths in modern times? Did he die of an infection or of septicemia? Why not? But we can't prove it. So we have to stop there. I think that he died of old age. It's a strong argument considering what an old person suffers on a daily basis. The various studies that were carried out on the mummy allowed us to gather precious information and gave the pharaoh a quite human dimension. However, the principal objective in bringing Ramesses II to Paris was to eliminate the germs that were destroying him. We identified around 60 different fungi. So we had to find a way of destroying these microorganisms which would not damage the rest of the mummy and would allow us to conserve it in a sterile environment. The properties of gamma rays corresponded perfectly to these demands. In order to eliminate all risk, we had to carry out tests and estimate the quantity of radioactivity required before we could start. Christian de Tassigny, an atomic energy engineer in Grenoble, ran these tests under the supervision of the dean, Mr. Balou. In the nuclear laboratory of the CENG, Nuclear Studies Center of Grenoble, Studies had been made prior to 1976 of the doses required to destroy mildew on parchments, graphic documents and leather. At the cryptogamy department of the Musée de l'Homme in Paris, several fungi were taken as samples from the mummy. They were then cultivated and prepared in two series. One was kept and the other was radiated. As the results of the experiment corresponded to predictions, the dose of radioactivity required for the mummy of Ramesses II was now established. What's more, the penetrating capacity of the gamma rays made it possible to treat the mummy once inside the exhibition case being prepared for its return to Egypt. The mummy and sarcophagus were placed inside the acrylic resin altuglass case, which in turn was enclosed in a supple but hermetic isolation unit. This unit, which resembled a glove box, would make it possible on arrival at the Cairo Museum to remove the packing in a sterile environment and avoid recontaminating the mummy once it had been through the radioactive chamber. On the morning of May 6, 1977, a motorcycle escort, followed by the Marine Nationale truck bearing the royal remains, crossed Paris on its way to the Saclay Center of Nuclear Studies, where the same Cobalt-60 sources as in Grenoble were waiting. On the night of May 6th, the mummy of Ramses II received the prescribed dose of 1.8 mega rad over a period of 12 hours. The dosometer inside the case confirmed the exactitude of the dose to within 10%.
the medical treatment in Paris seems to have been successful. The rapid degradation of the mummy has been stopped. But for how long? Time alone will tell. But we must remember that the eternal life of Ramses depended on a double condition, that both his body and his tomb be preserved forever. The mummy may have succeeded in surviving over the ages despite its tribulations, but what about the tomb? Let's return to Thebes, or what we now call Luxor, a tourist destination for millions of visitors who swarm to Egypt every year. On the other side of the Nile, the Royal Necropolis is one of the main attractions. Although the mummy of Ramses II has been the center of attention since 1881, his tomb has been closed to the public and abandoned for almost 100 years due to its poor state of repair and lack of security. Work only began on the Monuments of Eternity of Ramses II in 1991, directed by Christian Leblanc. Conscious of the constraints imposed by the touristic potential of a tomb such as this one, he has been working with a Franco-American team since the year 2000 on an original and innovative development plan. Exploration of the tomb is not an end in itself. It has enabled us to clear the area and see that it has been entirely pillaged and is empty. But the main aim is to understand how the decoration and the architecture went together so that we can draw up a program, both spatial and decorative, for the tomb, because Ramesses II's tomb is the place from which he must set off on his long journey. One of the things that we're very excited about is the ability to actually reproject elements that have been absent since antiquity in the burial chamber of KV7. So can we hope one day to see the tomb restored to its former glory with the great sovereign laid to eternal rest? It is my dream that I would like to do before I leave my office is to take all the royal mothers and put them in the tombs in the Valley of the Kings. And I will start with the mummy of this great king, Ramses II. If the mummy is preserved forever and something close to the original decoration of the tomb recreated, will the two conditions for Ramses' eternal rest not be united? We can't really say eternity. You know, the Chinese don't believe that it exists. So let's just talk of very long term. He has straddled several civilizations, so he has shown his staying power. And with all that's been done for Ramesses II, we know he will live as long as us, I mean, as our system. So we could say for the eternity of our system. Yes, I think he's won his wager, at least as far as we can tell today, because we don't know much about eternity. And I would say that his mummy has got its existence back because now it makes us dialogue and argue. It enables us to see the quality, in fact, of these pharaohs who have succeeded in crossing the ages. I find that really exceptional. Ramses has gone through all that with disconcerting ease. For all Egyptian pharaohs, one of their great goals was to live for eternity and to be known forever and ever. And Ramses II obviously was no exception to that. He, even within his lifetime, he almost achieved a certain eternity because he ruled for so long and he was deified. So, of course, gods are eternal. And so he was assuring himself of, of his immortality.
Ramesses was a king made God. He did everything to ensure that his body and his name should belong to eternity. And it's true that his mummy has defied time across the centuries. His tomb has lost much of its past splendor. 3,200 years have obliterated much of the decor. But something of the image so dear to the ancient Egyptians remains. At the time of the pharaohs, any work of art was considered a living being, and its creator was called he who makes live. To create a picture or to engrave a name was to freeze the essence of reality for time everlasting. <laughs>